make the point, I am, and that's when I'm asked to do classwork. Sometimes I throw things. I have begun to be physically aggressive by pushing my teacher and other students when I am frustrated. Mrs. Arnold, I need you help. I don't understand how to do this work. Timmy, why aren't you in your seat again? I am tired of telling you to sit down. But Mrs. Arnold, I don't know how to do this. Why won't you help me? Timmy, I have already explained the lesson. You weren't paying attention. Go sit down. You aren't supposed to be up. It is work time. I hate it here. I just want my question answered. <coughs> it's not my fault that you are stupid. You will not talk to me in that manner. You better believe that your mother will hear about this. You go to your desk and put her head down. Go ahead and call my mom. <coughs> you can't teach either. This is how you teach. You cannot make me sit down. Why don't you waddle your fat butt back to your desk? Oh. Timmy, you are disrupting the whole class. We shouldn't have to go through this every day. Go to your classwork and stop bothering the class. If you would just pay attention and work, Hardy.
it goes to special education, we can say, okay, we've got the data that we need. Um, so that's really what we're trying to get you today. How do we collect that tier three data? And this can be utilized as tier two as well. Okay, so our six foundations are all behavior is learned, behavior serves a function, environment impacts behavior, skill deficits impact behavior, team approach is critical, and teacher-student relationship matters. Um, and the, the team approach um, is so critical, and, and the reason being is because a lot of times we have a, a problem child in our classroom, and we get so close to the problem that we can't really step outside and see what might, be, what might work and what hasn't worked and what we've tried. So we want to look to our colleagues, that's our other teachers, um, our administration, uh, our behavior specialists, our LSSPs, and, and we all come to the table and we help each other. And that's what the team approach is talking about. And I'll go through each one. Okay. So the first one, all behavior is learned. So we know that from the time that we're born, you know, we learn certain behaviors. And we have learned that these certain behaviors get us the things that we want or need. Okay, so a baby cries, mom knows to come, feed the baby, change the baby. So the baby has already learned that when they cry, it, the baby is going to get some type of response. Okay, so it's going to be the same with <laughs> academic and behavior. We teach the behaviors we want. We never assume that the student uh, knows how to raise their hand or walk in the hallway. Okay, so the, again, these are all expectations that have to be taught. I want to stress the importance of behavior is, is not something um, that we can just say, okay, the student should know to do this. They should know how to act. They're in third grade. They've already been doing this since kindergarten. Sometimes some of these students do not have the skills to be able to perform whatever task you are asking them to, to, um, to perform. So it's important, again, just like we teach academic skills, how, for example, like if we're teaching reading, we teach them phonemic awareness and decoding strategies, <coughs> fluency, comprehension. It's going to be the same for behavior. You have to start with the first step and then build up. The next one is behavior serves the function. When we talk about function, we're talking about the reason for the behavior, the purpose that the student is having a particular behavior. Again, the baby's crying, the, the, the function for the crying is to get some kind of feedback. So they already know that their behavior is going to produce some type of outcome. Yeah, and really, it boils down to two things. Behaviors either get us something or they get us away from something. So we're either gaining something or avoiding something. So we have to keep it narrowed down to those two ideas to really we'll simplify things for us. Um, again, when we talk about the function, it's not an exact, we don't know exactly why the student is having that particular behavior. All we can uh, do is have a, um, a hypothesized function. Okay, so we're guessing, based on all the data that we've collected, that this is why the student is behaving a certain way. Environments impact behavior. So the classroom setting, the home setting, peers, family, all those environmental factors impact the way a student <coughs> behaves. Okay? Also, when we talk about the environment, we're talking about the antecedents, the setting, the, the time of day, the people that are around, the way people respond to the student's behavior. All of that has to do with the environment. Skill deficits impact problem behavior. Again, if the student does not, has not learned those skills needed to perform a, a particular task, whether it's academic or behavior, then they're not going to know what's expected of them. We also need to make sure that if they do have, um, if they have learned the skills, maybe it's a performance deficit. Maybe you know they, they do know how to do a certain task or um, certain behavior that you're asking of them, but they don't want to be able to perform. You know, a lot of times with kids, um, environmental, uh, things change in their environment. So maybe
made it been a well-behaved student, something changes at home, or might start seeing behaviors at school. Or a lot of times we see behaviors um, come along when they go from fifth grade to sixth grade. So they're going from that comforting elementary school environment where they're in the same classroom all day to an environment where they're asked to go from class to class and um, have more independent type behaviors. So um, it lots, sometimes developmentally we'll see a child like they're doing fine until maybe second grade and then they peak with those skills they don't and then we don't they don't have the skills to get to where they need to in third grade. So we start seeing some problem problematic behaviors in the classroom. So it could be a developmental thing, it could be um, environmental and uh, just depending on uh, the, the child, the individual child. So it's going to be also important to remember that you need to be very systematic and direct in your instructional approach. Never assume that the student knows how to do something or should be able to do something. Team approach is critical. So again, you need to have um, different points of view. Keep getting those observations from different teachers, getting input from different teachers, having administration come in and help you, counselors, specialists. That's all going to be important to be able to gather all the data that you need. Previous teachers have a wealth of information on this child. Parents have a wealth of information. Uh, we were in a staffing last week, and this parent just started telling us a lot of things about her child that we did not know. And so it was very valuable information for us because now we knew how to approach the behavior. Now we knew what kind of strategies to implement. And I'm very happy that you guys are here in teams. Um, we didn't really have that before. It was kind of just the counselor and the teacher. And so now that we have a team approach, that's going to be very effective in being able to create those interventions. <coughs> and lastly, relationships matter. For me, I think this is the most important because if you're able to establish that mutual relationship of respect and genuine care, then more than likely you're going to get the behavior that you desire. You can know all the behavior strategies, you, you can be doing everything right, but if that child knows that you really don't care about them or that you're just doing your job and you're, you're, you're just there, then they're really not going to perform for you. You're going to see the performance and that change in behavior when they realize that you do care about them and they, that you are there for them. And the, oh, um, the, the leg work also is really important with the parents. Um, I've been in so many situations where we could have avoided a lot of, um, you know, heartache and grief on the campus if we had really just done that leg work to build a relationship with the parent. Because we know we can do so much at school, and then they go home, and the parent's not, you know, trying to help us, and it, then it tears back down. And then we also get into some power struggles. And, we need the parent to be supportive of us so that when the child goes home, they're teaching their, their child to respect their teachers, that it's not their teacher's fault, and you know, they need to work on improving their behaviors as well. So, um, but that's just a little side note from me, uh, from my own experience, but, uh, of trying uh, cases that I've had. So again, so having that good relationship could probably be the most effective technique in making that change in the behavior as well as during the behavior and after the behavior. So if any of you have been CPI trained, it teaches you that your your relationship and the way that you approach the student is very critical in changing that behavior. So we are now going to go on to operationally define the behavior. You have a handout titled Steps in Designing Intervention Interventions looks like this. <coughs> and this is just going to walk you through the steps of how to create your intervention. So now that you know the important foundational concepts, where do you start? What's your very first step? Well, your very first step is collecting the data. But in order to collect the data, you need to know how to operationally define it. Okay? So is it observable? Is it measurable? Over there against the wall, I have a, an anchor chart that says 
how to operationally define a behavior. Can I see it or hear it? Can I measure it? And can another person coming in see the exact behavior description that I am seeing?
Last night I wanted to watch the Olympics. My kids at San Diego just streamed. I know I'm not supposed to put my kids up on the TV. <coughs> yeah, I'm right now.
we're going to get you there. We're just taking baby steps. So right now we just want you to start seeing the, the specific behaviors that the students demonstrate versus the baby.
So does this part make sense? The op operational definition and the data collection. Who yeah. collects this? The RTI. It's part of the RTI packet. But I mean, who who's going to collect? Uh, this, that's going to be determined. This either, actual like, right. So either the teacher can do it, which probably wouldn't make sense if she's teaching during that time. Um, it wouldn't make sense, or would would not. It would not. It would be too difficult for the teacher. Or we could use one of the strategies where they have the rubber band and you tally it. You have a rubber band, you get your marker, and every time the student does not do what you ask them to do or is showing that target behavior, you mark it on the rubber band. And then you go back and fill out the form. But we're not in there the whole time to observe these. The teacher? No, the teacher. No, she's the, teacher. the teacher. The teacher. The teacher. Okay. No, I, I, I would think um, for most, unless it's pretty severe, that um, I'm thinking like, you know, you're at tier two, um, maybe wanting to move to tier three. The teacher is perfectly capable of collecting this data. And um, another example, I have a teacher that I work with, and she she keeps um, marbles in one pocket. And every time the student does whatever the behavior is, she moves a marble over, or she puts the coins in her pocket. And this is the way she tallies. And at the end, she's like, okay, I've got five marbles today. And, um, and then she marks the tally marks. Um, another way, she sends a rubber band, or she um, just takes a little piece of paper here, and she makes a little mark. Um, there are really non-intrusive ways. And we're not looking for the teacher to do this the whole day. Um, we're looking to target certain little periods. And even if it's like, okay, say this student is displaying this behavior for a majority of the day, we're going to pick a time. We're going to we're going to do some time sampling. Maybe 15 minutes here, 15 minutes here, 15 minutes here. We're going to collect the data. Um, I, you know, it's too it's too intrusive and it's too burdensome for a teacher to take, you know, no, all day long about everything the student's doing. Um, so we need to figure out ways that we can go in and, and make it easy for the teacher. Um, make it non-intrusive, but that we can get data and know that our, our interventions are working. Um, another thing we'll talk about is fidelity to that intervention. And, we're, and that's where that collaboration and that peer support comes in. That you can have um, a fellow teacher, um, administrator, somebody come in and help you make sure that you're implementing the intervention in the way it was intended. So, like I said, a lot of times we get so close to the problem, we can't, we need help. And that's that's a normal thing for to happen, especially with problem children. And you get frustrated. Does that help? So the third foundational concept states that environment impacts behavior. So the the environment is going to be all those antecedents or triggers that are going on. So you have your antecedents, the prior events that happened before the behavior. And then you have the consequences, the events that happen after the behavior, or the outcome or the results. This chain of events will help us understand the function of the behavior so that when we put the A, B, and C together, it will allow us to come up with a hypothesized function of behavior. So some antecedents um, that can result in problem behavior are academic tasks, a given task or a group work. So in the video, we had seen that Sophia was given an, an ac academic task and her behavior was sharpening her pencil or tapping her pencil, okay? So <coughs> if you to see it, then you have your resulting behavior. Um, before we can start the intervention process, we must have a clear, concise description of what the resulting behavior so again, that's going to be your operational definition of the behavior. Some other antecedents could be independent work, transitions, and unstructured situations. In the video, I don't even think that the teacher really saw that the independent work was causing her frustration. When she asked her where the points went for the touch map, she didn't check for understanding. She assumed that Sophia already knew how to do it because they had been working on that concept for a while. Okay? She didn't ask Sophia to come up to the board and show her how to do it. 
she said, do you understand? Sophia said, yeah, 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 I do. But she didn't clearly check for that understanding. Also, it's important to consider the following <coughs> factors, the physical environment, the people that are present in that room, the other students, the way the other students interact with that student, the way the teacher interacts with the student. Um, is there clutter? Is everything organized? Is it disorganized? The lighting in the room, the noise in the room, all of those environmental um, factors affect the way a student behaves as well. Also, Think of the instructional task. Is it independent work, group work? <coughs> is it direct teach? Um, is it um, choral reading? What is the what exactly is happening at that moment right before the behavior occurs? Peer adult behaviors we talked about, and then internal factors. Is the child hungry? Are they tired? Are they thirsty? Does their stomach hurt? You know, this is a, there's so many factors that are going on, and, and because we don't know all those factors, that's why your function is hypothesis. Consequences also impact the behavior, the way, they, the way that adults respond, the way that peers respond to the behavior. It's going to determine if the student is going to continue engaging in that behavior. Consequences can be both positive or negative. Also, what one student might think is a positive consequence, another student might think is a negative consequence, and vice versa. Consequences are often associated with the function of the behavior and the reason that they continue to engage in that behavior. of the behavior. So now you're going to determine is it internal or external. Okay? So internal, for example, rocking in their chair to obtain a soothing effect or cussing to obtain peer attention. Was the external, sorry. Internal, walking out of the class to avoid embarrassment or external, hitting the teacher to escape the task. And then you can also see here that it just boils it down to those two uh, functions. And, and when I finally just boiled myself down to these two, it really um, helped me start starting to um, do that hypothesized function. So we all do some, we all engage in behaviors to obtain something or to avoid something. And um, <clears throat> this could even be to obtain sensory input, just like this child rocking in the chair. And um, the internal um, behavior of children are the ones that we tend to overlook. So it's the externalizing kids, the ones that are acting out and getting in, um, you know, getting on our nerves, <coughs> getting on their fierce nerves. They're the ones that we tend to see. So um, you know, be careful and make sure you know that you, you know that a child doesn't go under the radar um, and not you know complete their work or whatever because of this danger. Okay. So remember that behavior has a human need to either um, obtain something pleasant or escape something unpleasant. Also remember that what you think is pleasant or, or unpleasant may not be what the student thinks is pleasant. So we're going to do another activity. We're going to watch Sophia again. Um, and now you're going to get out your ABC data sheet. You got the
to avoid, avoid stuff and, and little uh, suggestions for you. So it kind of helps you take those baby steps through in getting that operational definition. So we're going to watch Sophia again. Um, and we're going to think about the time, uh, where, activity. And we've already discussed some of these, but it should be pretty easy. The antecedent behavior consequence and um, the hypothesis.
Friday. The time, we don't have the exact time. Um, but where? The classroom. The classroom. Activity? Yeah. Adults, peers, peers present? Teacher. Teacher and one student. The antecedent? Independent work. Independent work. What hours? Independent, independent math. So would everybody agree in, in, during independent math time? Yeah. Math assignment. The behavior. Water. Fidgeting. Eating out. by pencil. Sharpening. Behavior by. By how? Yeah. No, y'all are right on. And the consequence? No, no reason. No reason. No reason. Any other more subtle consequence? Teachers read your writing. Praise of the other students. Yeah, the student has not learned, but the other student was
your data. Your data is going to tell you what's going on with that student. So some sources of data are talk to people who know the student, previous teachers, the parent, the student. Uh, I had a student who um, has been acting out in the bus. And she's been acting out by cussing at other students, hitting other students, and nobody could determine what was going on with the student, why that was happening. All they knew is that as soon as she got on the bus, she started to yell profanity and started to hit other students. They had asked me to come in and observe the student to be on the bus, and so I did. I got on the bus, I pretended to be another student. She did not know that I was a teacher and at, at first. And once I saw that the behavior started to escalate is when I stepped up and I presented myself to her and of course you know, she was stunned that I was there. But as I started talking to her, she was telling me that the reason she does those behaviors is because she wants to be cool in front of the other kids. Well, the other kids, every time she would say a cuss word or would attempt to go at another student, they would give her their attention. They, they would egg her on. So she thought it was cool to get this attention from all the boys that were on the bus because at that time she was the only girl. So there's, a, there's only two girls on that bus and there's se seven boys. So here she is acting cool in her view to get the attention of the boys, okay? And all it took was me asking her, why do you do that? Why are you, you know, yelling at someone? So why do you use those words? And, you know, she said, because it's cool, because I think it's cool, and because the boys pay attention to me. So sometimes, you know, we, we forget to involve the student in this whole plan. Okay, so, so that's very important. Also, uh, observe the student in environments where the behavior is most likely to occur. So, again, the teacher had told me she does not have any of these behaviors in the classroom. It's all on the bus. So, I, you know, said, okay, then I'll ride the bus and I'll see what happens. You know, I got to see firsthand these words that were coming out of her mouth and the way she was acting. She, did, she does not act that way in the classroom because when I'm in the classroom, she doesn't have those behaviors. And as a, as a, a matter of fact, her and the other person that she directs these comments to are friends in the classroom, but as soon as she gets on the bus, she starts attacking this person. So again, observe the student in the environment where the behavior most likely occurs, and talk to the student. Get the information from the student. Um, also, I don't know if this is too soon to talk about this, but um, when you do have that conversation with the student, um, we can give you, uh, we can put on the you share some, they're called reinforcement surveys, and um, they're either uh, student director or teacher directed. Uh, one is called forced choice, and so it gives the child two choices. Um, so you present the scenario and then you say, would you rather have this or this? And this way you can, you can also get input from the student about what might be a good reinforcer or an alternative reinforcer to the, the one that we don't want. And so, Going on that forced choice survey, it'll um, it'll say like to get peer attention, adult attention, tangible items, sensory items. Okay, so it kind of gives you more information as to what that hypothesized function could be. Okay, so we are going to review your sample FBA.
this right here. Looks like this. I'm going to walk through here. At this table.
unfortunately. So. Okay, and the last one, summarize the function of behavior. Why is the student acting this way? What function is being met by the student's behavior? Is the behavior interfering with the student's learning and or the learning of others? What replacement behaviors will be taught in order to change the problem behaviors? So I indicated. When given an independent math assignment, Sophia will tap her pencil, sharpen her pencil, or ask to get water, go, go to the bathroom in order to escape from completing her independent math assignments. These behaviors are interfering with Sophia's learning as demonstrated by falling behind her grade level peers in the area of math and not being successful in passing this year's math benchmarks common assessments. Rather than tapping her pencil, sharpening her pencil, or asking to get water or go to the bathroom, Sophia will be given a pencil bag with multiple pencils, have a designated time when she is allowed to sharpen her pencils, will use a visual cue during transition to remind her to hydrate or use the bathroom, as well as have access to an emergency bathroom water pass three times per semester. Okay, so right now we're not going into the strategies just yet. Okay, we're just developing some replacement behavior. So instead of tapping her pencil, we're making her that noise, you're letting her tap her pencil on her lap where you can't hear it. Okay, or when she's walking in the hallway, you have already pre-taught her that whenever she sees a certain sign, she knows, okay, I need to go to the bathroom and take a water break right now because Ms. Gonzalez said that if I take it right now when I see that sign, then I can't use the bathroom, sorry. Or those three passes. Again, you have already explained to the student, you have three emergency passes for the, for the whole semester. Once they're up, they're up. Okay, so you're teaching replacement behaviors. Okay, these aren't strategies just yet. Does everybody understand that? Also, when you are doing your summary statement of behavior, there's an anchor chart right here to kind of guide you along. So when or during, then you list the summary of antecedents occurs, put the student's name, then identify the problem behavior in order to, and that's where you summarize the hypothesized function. So I have put, when given an independent math assignment, Sophia will tap her pencil, sharpen her pencil, ask to get water, go to the bathroom in order to escape from completing her independent math assignments. Okay. So we're going to watch a video and then on your blank FBA, you're going to fill, you're going to fill it out with some
have to do? Independent reading worksheet. What was the behavior? Throwing shoes, throwing a pencil, tapping her pencil. Yes. Can I see it? Can I hear it? Laughing, tapping her friend. Laughing. Yeah. What was the consequence? She didn't do her work. She avoided her work. Yeah, she avoided. And then uh, she also got her friend's attention. But um, that's more about what she's attaining and avoiding. So that's more into the hypothesis or the function. Uh, so the consequences, she didn't have to do that. Or she got it away. Didn't complete the work. Does that make sense? The consequence, I know we're, we're used to being like, the consequence, well, she didn't get to go to recess, or, you know, she got something taken away from her, or she got punished. The removal from the circle would have been there, got somewhere else. That's the consequence to the removal from And that goes back to what I asked in the last scenario. Is it the consequence that the, it's the teacher in charge gave, or the lack of what they didn't get? Like, they didn't get the instruction, but they also got out of the circle. So, is it safe to say that sometimes a consequence can be vague or, or yeah. observable? Or it can be more than one thing, right? Yeah. Um, what is the consequence? So, um, really, we're trying to get to that obtain or avoid piece, because that's how we're going to tailor our intervention. And then, uh, I, if we have some questions about the obtain or avoid piece, whether that's from the teachers. Yeah, we had some questions on the hypothesized function, whether is it from the teacher's perspective or the student's perspective. And this is going to be from the student's perspective, so we'll, we'll walk through it. So, in the video with Anne, did she obtain sensory st stimulation? Did anybody see any type of sensory stimulation that she was receiving? She, you know, rocking back and forth, did she, um, did, um, she banging her head, she banging her head. These yeah. are kind of sensory things that kids typically do. Did she obtain attention from a peer? Yes. yes. Did she obtain attention from an adult? Yes. yes. Did she obtain a tangible item, stickers, food, some, was something given to her? No. The next one, avoid. Did she avoid her work or the task? Yes. yes. Did she avoid the demand or the direction? Yes. Yeah, she avoided... Um, Doing her, her worksheet. Did she avoid an individual? Did she avoid an item, an object, or an activity? What did she avoid? The math, the math assignment, right? So does that make sense now? That part? And like you can see, there's um, several functions that we're we're guessing at right now. As you watch the student more than one time. You can maybe fine tune that and, and say, okay, really, it's not to get the peers' uh, the peers' attention. Maybe what we're really seeing is that she's getting out of that assignment, or vice versa. Um, so it, you know, this is we've just seen him one time, and we're making a guess based on one observation. So on your um, functional behavior analysis that you completed with your partner, let's go through that. Mm -hmm. So the student was in. What was the behavior? Object behavior, disruptive noises, inability to focus. Avoiding. Avoiding. Did everybody hear that? Does not complete reading assignment, avoiding tapping her pencil, to, uh, tapping the student next to her, giggling, laughing. But try not to use the words avoid or obtain those, those, the, the hypothesis, remember? I mean, the function. So try to avoid using those words when you're describing the behavior. Right now, we just want to we want to say, what do I see? What and what? Um, what do I hear? What do I see? What do I hear? So we see her not doing her assignment correct, and then by you know throwing her pencil or whatever, what have you, or get you know disrupting class by we have a lot of dis class disruptor. Antecedents? What was the antecedent? As to work, what kind of work? Independent, independent reading, worksheet. The time, again, uh, we don't have specific time, but it was during reading. The setting, classroom, reading, and the teacher present, and the other students. The duration, we don't, we don't have an exact time on that. Uh, the intensity, mild, moderate, severe. Did she stop when she was reading?
consequence? What happened afterwards? So she got out of doing her reading assignment, right? She was removed from the group. Uh, her friend laughed at her. Peers laughed. And so what was the function of the behavior based on your ABC sheet? Obtain peer attention and <coughs> So summarize the function of the behavior. So again, you're going to use your, your summary statement of behavior. When given an independent reading assignment, did someone finish it for me? Ms. Horosco, thank you for sharing. Can you say that louder? Okay. Um, when given an independent reading assignment um, and avoids it by uh, asking one thing or unnecessary questions, legally talk, talking with classmates and turning work over, um, uh, Anne's performance is being affected if she is only behind her grade level peers rather than having to work without interaction and will be allowed to show the teacher progress every three questions to avoid speaking to or touching other students and will have a private workspace and the bill need to draw her in the evening. She will be given a designated part for me time after work is completed. Can everyone hear that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's always perfect. Wow.
water break time. Okay, so again, you need to let them know what your expectations are instead of just assuming that, well, they should already know. And for um, hard, more challenged students, we may actually walk them through what that looks like. Actually walking them to the sign, having them look at the sign, you know, how this, how, how do we walk into the restroom, you know, and then have them practice and model. Um, and probably we are not going to just be able to do this one time. We're going to need to do it a bunch of times to really reinforce what they've learned. So, um, just like we do at the beginning of the year, how do you walk into the classroom and we have the students walk into the classroom? Uh, you know, and every day for several weeks, we, we you know, if they don't walk in appropriately, we may have them. Start again, okay, how do we walk into the classroom? You know, that's that modeling, that teaching. So some of our more challenged students, we actually have to hold the handful and teach them that behavior. Right, so it's gonna be again like teaching those ac um, academic skills. Teach, model, practice. Teach, model, practice. Okay. Student involvement, um, we have already talked about this, so involve the student and the parent. Again, the student can give you a lot of information as to why they're behaving a particular way, or they might not give you any information at all. They might not talk to you. They might shut down. Um, they just There's nothing coming from the student. Always go to the parent. Let the parent know what's going on. Invite them to those RTI meetings. Invite them to those staffings. Get to know the parent. Get to know what is the student like. Most of the time they're going to tell you, well, my child doesn't act like that at home. Okay, well, why? Why do you think your child doesn't act like that at home? You know, at school, when I tell him to do this, this is what he does. What happens at home when you tell him to do that? So kind of, you know, get, try to establish that relationship with the parent where you don't come off as putting all the blame on the parent for not being a good parent or for the student for being a bad student. Try to put, you know, be empathic and Try to put yourself in the parent's shoes. Um, this happened to me the other day. And it just, I, had, I just had really reflected. Um, I have a two year old, and the teacher, you know, at, at his daycare was like, um, Let me ask you, is he verbal at home? And my child is so verbal at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, all he does is whine. And when we ask him what's wrong, he won't tell us. And, you know, and I'm sitting there going, Oh my gosh, I'm in my parents' shoes right now. You know, I have, and I feel like the, 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 I felt totally defensive, like, really? So is this, you know, you're accusing me of being like, you know, what, what, what are you accusing me? And then I'm thinking, okay, how do you expect me to fix this, right? He's in your classroom. So I felt really, I just, it just all went like, oh my gosh, I get it now. I get how these parents feel. And I know that's kind of mild. It's not what a lot of our parents experience, but it really just hit home. And, that, and so we really have to be, you know, careful how we approach the parent.
variables that make reinforcers more effective, they have to be immediate, frequently, enthusiasm, eye contact, description of the behavior, anticipation, and variety. So you can't give them the same reinforcers every day or every week because after a while it's no longer a reinforcer. They're going to want something new. So you have to um, have different reinforcers for different, for different behaviors. And the, that force choice re reinforcement survey will give you um, a lot of information. Again, you know, do they prefer um, peer attention, adult attention, tangible items, sensory stimulation? In DocuShare, there is, um, under the Behavior Resources tab, there are some inexpensive rewards for elementary and secondary students. It lists about 100 for each. There's so many different rewards that we can give the students rather than you know, those chips at the end of the week or, or candy. Like all the 
the different things that the kid could be engaging in. Um, so, and it, it is pretty detailed. So, okay. And so um, you have your tier one interventions, and then you click on it. And this looks more like tier two interventions, but you can click on the intervention, and then it tells you why you should do it, how you should do it, resources. you notice I did not verbally react to the student's misbehavior? All I did is redirect them. See, it's my job not to escalate, but to de-escalate the situation. I'm not bothering anybody. And have you stopped in your chair? I'll sit back in my chair if I want to. It's a free country. <coughs> Sometimes it's hard to walk away from a student when they give you an attitude. But if they're complying, which is your immediate goal, you'll want to deal with that attitude later. This is one of the best ways to keep out of power struggles in the classroom. Emily, I need you to sit down. I appreciate that you sat down, and we'll talk at recess. <laughs> Telling students you'll talk with them later is not allowing them to get away with anything. You're choosing a time when they're calmer, you're calmer, and you have a much better chance of actually helping them gain control of their behavior. When a defiant student tries to hook you into a verbal exchange, what do you look at? Remember four key steps. Mm -hmm. Listen and acknowledge that you've heard what the student has said. Redirect the student to the task at hand. Defer to a future conversation. This is stupid. Several different techniques will help you with listen, acknowledge, redirect, defer. Each of them has different strengths. Each helps you stay out of an escalating, no-win power struggle. Tyler, I need you to sit down. Anything else? 
when correcting the close proximity to the, from across the classroom. Right. Exactly. Oh, you think the north is coming away? Oh, it's coming away. Yes, right. Um, and then I saw one that would be like tier one classroom wide was, uh, for example, the clapping of the hands to get everyone's attention. I really, I mean, I just, I, it's so funny to work with teachers because they're like, well, what do I do? And I'm, I'm like, you're already doing so much. And they don't realize how much they, how many tricks they already have. So it's just the, those are tier one. That's what, what the tricks that teachers already have in their bag. Okay, so one more.
strategies, but she, the, the teacher really, um, she made it a point to have that relationship with her students from the very beginning. So as soon as they walked in the door, she greeted each student. She essentially, essentially started the day on a good note for each student. And instead of having that power struggle and a long, drawn-out conversation about releasing the cell phone, she simply kind of redirected their attention to how was their weekend. Um, of course, she had already set the expectation of when you see this basket, your cell phone goes in that basket. She didn't use any words. She just held the basket out. She engaged the students in a conversation about them, and then they complied with the directive. Okay. Um, there's a lot of good strategies in there. I mean, the break, basically, just bringing back the, the teachers. We already have so many tools in our, our trick bag. I just don't think that... A lot of times teachers realize that they're using the strategy in the classroom. And then obviously, um, tier two intervention would be more specific to the student's needs. And then uh, when we get to the tier three, that's when we want to do the in-depth functional analysis to really just figure out that function. Also, it's good to remember, um, and the teacher modeled this, where she gave directives in three. So at the end of the lesson, she said, close your book, push in your chair, and line up. That's all she had to say. Three things, and the students comply. Close your book, push in your chair, and line up. So I don't think we have time to work with your team to develop the strategies, but you do have your ABC strategies. So depending on what's going on in the antecedent and in the consequence, that will let you know which strategy you can put in place, whether you want to put an antecedent strategy, a consequence, consequence strategy, or both. Okay? Again, you can also use a PBIS world as your strategy. <coughs> the components of a good behavior support plan uh, Strategies for increasing the desired behavior. Remember that any behavior strategy that is selected should be person-centered and research-based. The plan that you're developing is only for that student. A lot of times we see, you know, copy and paste. And for a lot of these problem behaviors, yes, it does have certain strategies that, that you can use. But the intervention plan is going to be student-specific. The intervention should occur at multiple levels to be successful. So that is why um, we have you give that plan to the counselor, to the principal, to the cafeteria staff, so that everybody is using the same intervention. Because if once one teacher gives in, then the student has already learned, well, I can get away with it with her, so maybe I'll cause, cause trouble with this teacher so that I can go to the other teacher who lets me do it. Okay, so here are some examples of how you can modify the consequence. So for the first section, we have the antecedent is a difficult assignment. The behavior throws paper. The consequence, the teacher corrects, peers laugh, and the function to gain attention by peers and teacher. They kept the antecedent and the, the behavior the same. However, they modified the consequence so now they have teachers and peers ignore, they give attention to on-task behavior, and <coughs> the function does not get attention for throwing, but attention for only on-task. So again, the teacher in the video only gave attention to those behaviors that she wanted to see. So when she asked a question and the other students were responding without raising their hand, she did not give attention to those students. She gave the attention to the student who was raising his hand. Teacher helps the student. 
student when the hand is raised. The function, gain attention from peers and teacher, and the function remain the same. You continue to gain the attention from the peers and the teacher. So different uh, functions have different strategies. So for example, if the function is to get access to desired activities or tangibles, the strategy could be to deny access to the activity or tangible after a problem behavior, after the consequence or to teach acceptable alternatives to obtain access, the replacement behavior. If the function is to escape or avoid an unpleasant activity, task, or person, your strategies can be to reinforce the student for compliance to your instructions, the consequence, you would modify the consequence, teach the student how to seek help, modify the, the uh, behavior, so now it's a replacement behavior, Teach acceptable alternatives to escape, again, your replacement behavior. Reinforce the student for the absence of the problem, so you're only going to reward the appropriate behavior, and you're going to modify the consequence. And E, initially remove or reduce demands, and then gradually increase you would modify the answer. These are pretty self-explanatory. Self why the function is so important to choosing the intervention. Because the once you decide on a function or you guess it, what that function is based on your your, uh, your data, then you pick the intervention in order to uh, based on that function. So the function drives what intervention you choose. Mm -hmm. So now we're gonna do one together as a whole group. Oh I'm sorry, let me go through this. Um, if the function is to get attention from peers or teachers, the strategy would be to increase attention for appropriate behaviors, modify the consequence, ignore the problem behavior, again, you modify the consequence, or you teach acceptable alternatives for attention, you modify the behavior and teacher doesn't behave. If the function is to get sensory stimulation, the strategy would be to interrupt and redirect the student, so you would modify the antecedent, use reinforcement when behavior is not occurring, modify the consequence, or increase access to alternative sources of stimulation, modify the antecedent. Okay, so now we're going to do this one as a group. So using your ABC sheet that you have in the antecedent strategies, behavior strategies, and consequence strategies, we're going to come up with ways that we can modify the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence. And the consequence. Okay. So let's go and refer to our antecedent worksheet, and we'll do the first one. Like for a student who makes noise. So Sophia was tapping her pencil. 
plants. Teacher has students put his head down on the desk. If you go to your consequence strategies, what are some strategies that we can use from here to modify that consequence? So instead of having the student put his head down, what could we do?
again, uh, we have the student, Sophia, the day we completed the implementation dates, the student's teacher, the team members assisting in the completion of the form, and then the behavior. So now you're going to gather all your information from your FBA. So the behavior was tapping pencil, sharpening the pencil, asking to get water, and go to the bathroom. The goal that you want to have in place to improve the behavior is Sophia will complete a nine task by coming to class prepared, starting work when requested by teacher, asking for help on a task if needed, and turning in the completed assignment when finished. That is the goal. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, it's just that's what that's your expectation of what you want the student to, to accomplish. The objective, indicate in measurable terms how the student will demonstrate progress. So I had the goal and I broke down the goal into short-term measurable objectives. So the first one is, when presented with a math assignment, Sophia will complete her assignments by coming to class prepared seven out of ten times over a nine-week period. Objective number two, when presented with a math assignment, Sophia will start work when, when requested by teacher seven out of ten times over a nine-week period. Objective number three, when presented with a math assignment, Sophia will ask for help on a task seven out of ten times over a nine-week period. And objective number four, when presented with a math assignment, Sophia will turn in completed assignment when finished 100% of the time over a nine-week period. So do you see how I just broke down the goal into smaller steps? So instead of having her be able to complete that whole goal, I broke it into small steps. <coughs> the interventions implemented, I started with the replacement behavior again, and I specifically noted these are examples, but not limited to. Tapping pencil, Sophia will tap her pencil on her lap. Sharpening pencil, Sophia will have multiple pencils and a designated time when she is allowed to sharpen pencils. Asking to get water or go to the bathroom. During transitions, Sophia will be taught to pay attention to the water fountain. This will be used as a visual cue to remind her at that moment to hydrate and reduce the bathroom. Sophia will have access to an emergency bathroom water pass three times per semester that she will be responsible for presenting only prior to the bell ringing or during independent practice rather than during direct teach. Okay, so in this replacement behavior, I need to teach Sophia each replacement behavior that I want her to demonstrate. Okay, so I'm teaching her, you know, when when you see um, a water fountain, that is your cue to know that it's time for you to go to the bathroom for kids. The opportunities, these are consequential responses and they can be positive or negative. So the opportunities essentially are your consequences. Set clear expectations and rules to include Clear, consistent, and predictable consequences that equate to the level of the behavior demonstrated. Explain the assignment by tell, show, and practice. Explain the directions. Again, you're going to use your directives in three. Get started on your work by putting your name, date, and filling in all three blanks on your worksheet. Provide visual support, which may include written instructions, holding up materials, or manipulatives during a demonstration. Pointing to provide, pointing to provide visual cue and and encouragement. Your prevention strategies. The following are strategies to be utilized to prevent the problem behavior from occurring. So now I use the strategies from your ABC sheets that you have. So the antecedent strategies. Increase the amount of support that you provide. Use individual instruction. Activity arrangement before you start. What do you need? Arrange activities so that Sophia understands the steps. Material accommodation. Arrange activities to provide accessible material and decrease frustration. And scaffolding interactions. Provide Sophia with guidance on the steps to successful in interactions. B 
behavior strategies teach alternative ways to obtain or escape attention, and consequence strategies sure I will program or reinforcement of non-occurrence of the behavior. Your reinforcement techniques, the following are techniques to be utilized in response to the occurrence of the challenging behavior. Provide a verbal reminder of the behavioral expectation by repeating the replacement behavior options. Allow the student wait time that was previously defined to state specific replacement behavior. Delay interactions with the student and set up a time to discuss the behavior and encourage verbal interaction by increasing opportunities to make connections, build your relationship with the student, and avoid power struggles. Then you list the interventionist. Their review date is when you're going to come back to review the progress. What is the type of progress monitoring data that you're going to use? In this instance, we use the frequency monitoring document. And then evaluation of results. How did the student respond to the interventions? So based on my frequency monitoring document, Sophia completed her assignments without disturbing others around her five out of 10 times. So does that make sense? Do you see how I just linked everything that was in the FBA straight to the Behavior Action Plan? Okay. Um, we only have about 15 minutes left, so we won't be able to do the Behavior Action Plan as a group right now. I hope that that's okay. <laughs> Um, we're going to go straight into implementing the plan and collecting the data. So you're going to use your frequency monitoring document again. And now you're going to have uh, your, your, your data points of when you started implementing the interim. So you have your baseline, you put your line, like three days, and then the date that you started your intervention. And generally for behavior, it's four to six weeks of implementation depending on the severity of the behavior. I have a question. Yes. Sorry. Okay, so she did not meet the, the goals, correct? Correct. Five out of ten. Right. Five out, five out of ten, I'm sorry. So then um, we're going to do an, another behavior. Okay, so now so now we're going to come back as an RTI team and we're going to decide. Or do we need to change anything? Is she making progress? She is making progress. You know, she's almost there. Should we give that plan another nine weeks, another four weeks, another two weeks? Another two weeks. So it's all going to just really depend on how much progress she's making, the severity of the behavior, to determine, you know, should you continue with that plan and how long are you going to continue with it? Or do we need to tweak it? I mean, we don't need to reinvent the wheel if, if it's still, if we're still thinking, okay, it's the same function, um, and we need to tweak what interventions we're using and see if we can make some improvement or increase the, the amount of intervention. Um, but we should include that here where it says evaluation of results or not. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do? No. Or is there another no, place that we, we will talk um, about? Do we document with, uh, that on the um, RTIs? Summary form. And I think you said that the behavior action plan is on edge of The behavior action plan is on edge of so is the FBA. Um, they need to be updated. The ones that I created uh, for this training, uh, it's much simpler, so I need to go back into edge of and make sure they match. Okay? And then I'll put it into DocuShare as well. So I don't know if the um, the policies have changed, but uh, in the past I know I had said you could either do it on DocuShare and upload it into Edgeforia or just go straight into Edgeforia and do it that way. With regard to uh, um, the tiers, with regard to behavior tiers, nothing has been changed. The documents that were in there are the ones that are currently in there. Okay. And so this is much like doing the academic tiers, uh, the academic plan, the behavior plan. You do the, you, you have your paperwork that, that lends you to the strategies, interventions you're going to use. Then you, you implement them for four or five weeks, whatever appropriate. Then you review them, and uh, you either continue or you change them. 
Right. So it's, it's a parallel. It's parallel to the academic plans. You're just addressing behaviors instead of uh, academics. Exactly. Just think of like the reading fluency. We want, I mean, you know, Annie is able to read X amount of words in this amount of time. And then you get your baseline. So we know right now she's only able to read this many words in this amount of time. And then we set our goal and we implement the intervention piece, whatever that may be. Um, and then we, we progress monitor and then we come back and we review is this being effective. And if, if not, we may do go to pull out with the reading specialist. It's the same thing with behavior. Um, so like a tier two intervention uh, would be more intensified. It could, it could even be like a pull out uh, with a counselor for some social skills in a group setting. Um, if that's if that's needed. Um, so I mean, just think of it. How, who are the players? You know, for reading, we've got our reading specialist. So they are player there for behavior, uh, for that support. And then um, tier three, obviously, utilize. At the <coughs> I know I'm available for my campus to consult at tier three and to help help them get used to this part. This, you know, the more in depth FBAs and all that. I mean, because that's. It can be a little overwhelming at first, but I think once you do it a few times, um, you'll see that it's it's not as difficult as it looks on paper at first. And I think I think one of the, the message here is, is that uh, there are tools here, and and that's the reason that I ask you to come in teams. I ask that you bring at least three people per campus because this is this is a lot to do. It, it can appear to be overwhelming, but it's a process that we have to go through, and to it's. It's not really reasonable to expect one person on your campus to burden this entire, to carry this load. Um, that's just not really doable. And so, yes, you have on your campuses, uh, in elementary, your counselors, in your, well, all levels, your counselor is your, is your person responsible for the behavior tier, but that doesn't mean that they do all of the work. It's a collaboration from teachers collecting data to, uh, to putting it together, to meeting with your RTI team on your campus to make decisions. Um, one person cannot do it all. That's the reason that I have, have encouraged you to create an RTI team where you can come together and make these decisions and so, so that the burden is not put on one person because that just isn't possible. Right. We wouldn't do that to our reading specialists. You or know, our counselors. I mean, like at Tier 1, we wouldn't make our reading specialists go in and like work one-on-one -on -one with the student. You know, that, that, the reading specialist would give the teacher some ideas to maybe some strategies that she can utilize. And even at tier two, um, and then and then we might look to doing some pullout with the resources. But up until then, she's more of a consultant, and the teacher's the one that needs to do the legwork. And the special education department can't do this for us, but they can be a support, and that's just what they're trying to do today. They're trying to empower us to know how to take care of this. So can they help us until we get comfortable with it? Absolutely. But can they do it for us? Absolutely not. They can't do it, but they can be a resource. But just like we're weaning the kids off the behaviors, we, we ha they have to be weaned off of it too. We have to be able to do it in general education and then, then just be that resource. So that's the, one of the goals here today is to empower us by getting us some information so that we can become more independent in doing this in general education. And that was one of the reasons why I had created the RTI resource document. It's on DocuShare and I believe every campus has one, every campus has a binder and it walks you through the problem solving process of RTI. So the academic process and the behavior process is exactly the same. You start with identifying your problem and then problem analysis, plan development and plan evaluation. Okay, so the process is the same. Academic behavior, so you're going to evaluate that effectiveness is it working? Do we need to change anything? Do we need to modify the intervention? We make our changes, yes or no. We implement the plan. We collect our data. We come back to, to review. Is it effective? Is it working? Do we need to modify? Do we keep going? Do we stop? And it's, it's just a cycle. It's a process. And it's, it's going to be exactly the same for academic and behavior. And then you have your procedures for implementing step-by-step um, -step RTI, and it walks you again, step-by-step, -step, tier one initial, tier one follow-up, tier two initial, tier two follow-up, and it's, the steps are exactly the same for academic and behavior. The only thing that's going to be different is now, you're, for behavior, you're going to have your FBA <coughs> and your behavior plan. And don't forget that these things just go, can go hand-in-hand. Hand. I mean, think of Sophia. 
she was looking like she might be lacking some of the, the academic skills that were causing some of the behavior issues. So right now what I see a lot that come down the pipeline is beautifully, um, beautiful reading interventions provided for a student with the documentation of a diagnosis of ADHD. And then when I get, when I look at the behavioral observations conducted in the classroom, it's unable to focus, off task, moving about the classroom. So yes, we may have the deficit in reading, but the behavior portion piece has never been addressed. And so when I get that evaluation, I'm thinking, well, geez, what is it? Is it the ADHD, or the behavioral issues, or is it the reading, or is it both? And so um, that's where it becomes really tricky um, as far as eligibility for, edu for special education goes. So we've, these things go hand in hand. And uh, we were going to do another activity, but we don't have time for that. that. That was a case study. By the way, the case study and all these forms are on DocuShare. If you ever want to do like um, a training on your campus, you're more than welcome to use the form that are on there. And then again, just recapping uh, those foundational concepts. All behavior is learned. Behavior serves a function. Environment impacts behavior. Skill deficits impact behavior. Team approach is critical and relationships matter.